there are lots of experiments that have come and gone. And not just experiments you'll find in science laboratories or chemistry classes. For example, if you were around for the early days of Facebook, back when it was known as the Facebook, you might remember the slogan, a social experiment. But it wasn't the first social experiment, and it certainly won't be the last. Prohibition, otherwise known as a constitutional ban on the making and selling of alcoholic beverages, was known as the Noble Experiment from 1920 to 1933. It's safe to say the experiment failed, considering many lost their jobs, restaurants and clubs were put out of business, and prohibition gave way to corruption and an increase in underground crime, not to mention an exorbitant amount of power wielded to mobsters and bootleggers like Al Capone. Jello Biafra of the Dead Kennedys once said, For every prohibition you create, you also create an underground. And that underground is what we're going to explore today. I'm your host, Emily Prokop, and this is the story behind speakeasies. But first, a quick word from Hashtag Potter and Family, a great group of indie podcasters like me. What is the Potter and Family? Hey, this is Shane. That's not oh, Shane. That's a robot set by the government. And that's Kenny from I'm now that I'm... a robot, too. From now that I'm older. More like now that I'm robots. This is Gabriel Russo from the Hollywood Scandals of Yesteryear podcast. This is Steve. From the Drift and Ramble podcast. This is Nick from the Epic Film Guys podcast. This is Emily from The Story Behind. This is Adam from Everyone Has a Podcast. This is Sean Harrigan from the Cinescape podcast. We are you. Podcasters coming together in a community to help one another grow. So follow us on Twitter at Potter Family and use the hashtag Potter Family in your tweets and retweet other people who do the same. Potter Family, where great podcasts come home. Before we talk about speakeasies, we need to talk a bit about the need for them. Originally in the 1830s, dry organizations like the anti saloon League and the Women's Christian Temperance Union began pushing for moderation in the consumption of wine and beer and the prohibition of hard liquor like gin and rum. Following the Civil War, soldiers began to frequent saloons, and it was no secret that saloons didn't host the most family-friendly of activities. And the temperance movement grew stronger. The more noble women at the time were banned from saloons, and with many moving further west for mining, saloons became considered dens of sin, and the temperance movement evolved into not just banning hard liquor, but any alcoholic beverage. Prohibitionists marched in the streets and began asking the government to get involved, and in 1919, Congress passed the 18th Amendment, banning the manufacture, sale, and transportation of liquor and the law took effect in January of 1920. But alcohol consumption was far from eradicated. Prohibition merely meant people would have to find other ways of consuming alcoholic beverages. Remember, the law didn't state that people were banned from imbibing liquor, just the manufacture, sale, and transport. So while police shut down bars and saloons, secret taverns and bars known as speakeasies sprang up around the country. It's difficult to find an origin for the term speakeasy. Some say it was because some underground bars required a customer to use the word as an entrance password. Another origin comes from 1889, from before it was used to describe secret taverns. It was used as a blanket term for any establishment you couldn't talk about in public or speak about in an easy manner. By 1925, Tens of thousands of speakeasies were known in New York City alone. Many were hidden away in regular shops and stores, but some were hidden as part of upscale restaurants like the 21 Club, which had underground passages that led to a secret wine cellar. It was during this time period that mobs were raking in cash by providing these establishments with liquor, wine, and beer that they would ship from outside the country. Men who had never broken the law before in their lives were easily swept up in the bootlegging business because of the gobs of money that could be made from it. And men like Al Capone were able to influence policemen to turn the other way as they peddled alcohol to those who could afford it. Running on a platform of economic change and the repeal of prohibition, Franklin Roosevelt won the 1932 presidential election, and the 18th Amendment became the first constitutional amendment to be repealed on December 5th, 
1933. If you remember the episode, The Story Behind the Electoral College, it takes three quarters of the states to repeal an amendment, and Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Utah were the last of the 36 needed to approve the 21st Amendment, which returned control of liquor laws back to the states. This is why it wasn't until 1966 that Mississippi became the last state to repeal prohibition. And you may still find counties and towns that are known as dry that don't sell alcohol. The first team of Budweiser Clydesdales was sent to the White House to give President Roosevelt a case of beer, but it's said that Roosevelt chose to celebrate the repeal with a dirty martini. His wife Eleanor is credited with saying, Little by little it dawned upon me that this law was not making people drink any less, but it was making hypocrites and lawbreakers of a great number of people. Even though Prohibition ended in 1933, the word speakeasy still has the exciting connotation of a secret meeting place, and many cities in America still have bars and saloons that aren't visible to the naked eye. So why, if Prohibition isn't around anymore, do speakeasies still exist? Call it nostalgia, or maybe more restaurant and bar owners have begun catering to the introverts like me who long to go out but want to interact with as few people as possible. For those who like a challenge, there's Circa 33 in Portland, Oregon. The number 33 in the name refers to the year Prohibition was repealed. The speakeasy is hidden in the back of the restaurant, and you would need to find the daily password and enter the code into a book titled Mafia, which can be found in the bookshelf by the bathrooms. The bookshelf will then swing open and reveal a small bar hidden from plain sight. In Sandy Springs, Georgia, you can find the chapter room in the basement of Taco Mac, However, like the days of Prohibition, you would need special accreditation to get in. You must be a member of Taco Mac's Brewiversity program for entrance. In New York City, you can find the aptly named back room in the back of the Lower East Side Toy Company. Supposedly, they still serve their drinks in teacups like speakeasies did during Prohibition. I'm not sure why more toy companies don't consider this, especially for frustrated parents around the holidays who need that little pick-me-up after not being able to find any Hatchimals. The role of Jello Biafra was played by Mark from the Unskippable podcast, and Eleanor Roosevelt was played by Tammy Turwell, general manager of 95.1 KRCC, Southern Colorado's NPR station. Information for this episode was sourced from BrainyQuote.com, History.com, legendsofamerica.com, dailymail.co.uk, blackpast.org, thrillist.com, and ushistory.com. For these links and more, visit the show notes at thestorybehindpodcast.com. Follow on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at storybehindpod, or subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you'll never miss an episode. Thanks for listening.